Hardly anybody here give me a shout out this time. Good morning, Creekside! Good morning! But I'm gonna do it anyway. All right, a couple announcements today. First of all, our Creekside karaoke, Saturday, August 24th. Doors will open at 6 p.m., music will start at 6 30. Um, we are going to have childcare in the back. We will have potluck dinner, uh, teen trivia. I'm working on my trivia questions for you all, and musical shenanigans. So, this is a night for us to just come out and enjoy each other's company, socialize, hang out, you know, have a good old Creekside time. Um, you don't have to sing if you don't want to. That's completely fine. All musical abilities are welcome. Just wait till you hear me. It's great. Uh, just come and hang out with us. Let's, uh, let's let our hair down a little bit, everybody. All right, my next, my next announcement. I know it's early. No, we're not quite there yet. Fall has not exactly fallen on us, but Creekside Trunk or Treat. <laughs> okay, 
sorry. All right, so we're going to do a little bit different this year. Um, normally, we deck the whole church out, and we have everybody come through and, and do all that. And I'll be real honest, I don't have a very good theme for this year, and all of my uh, mental abilities are currently being taken up. So, but what we're going to do is we're going to do a fall festival. Um, Jimbo and I talked about it this morning, and I want you all to know we're very excited. So we're thinking pumpkin chucking, haha, <laughs> I said it right this time, pumpkin chucking, hay bale maze, chili cook-off, bake sale, games, the whole thing, there's a whole big list on my whiteboard in the office if you want to go take a look at it, but um, it's going to be really exciting, it's going to be more of a like traditional fall, fall thing. So I can tell you right now that we are going to need lots of help for this. Um, We'll need people to, like, you know, make chili, first of all. I'm going to make chili, and it's really good. So just do that. Other people do that as well. And we're going to need people to – I think we're going to actually set up trunks outside this year. So we'll need some people who want to back their cars up and decorate trunks. Just come come volunteer. Have a good time. I know that we are going to need pumpkins and hay bales. Those are the two donation needs I can tell you right off the bat that we are absolutely going to need. And Jimbo said that the little pumpkins fly the best. So keep that in mind. Who said? Did you say? Yeah. Zeke agrees. The little pumpkins fly the best. So that's all I got for you. Get back to worshiping. you 
All right, so it is second Sunday of the month, so that is communion day, and uh, I was trying to think of, you know, what I wanted to talk about a little bit, uh, I mean, obviously the big thing right now in the world is the Olympics, coming to a close today, uh, most of the events have been run, okay, they're going to have their closing ceremony later today, actually probably in France, probably somewhere around now, but um um, if you think about what that event is, that event is designed to kind of bring the world together, okay? You know, bring everybody, put everything aside, let's bring everybody together, this unified event, you know, let's watch our athletes compete and cheer on our country. Um, and a lot of times that happens, but then a lot of times you look at a lot of the controversy that comes up, you know? The opening ceremony caused a lot of division and, and controversy. And then you've got a, a questionable boxer in one group or a, or something in another group. And it's like, you start getting a lot of this hate that gets spewed out there. And a lot of that's on social media, it gets spread around. It's like, it kind of takes away a little bit from the purpose of the games. And I mean, like, you know, you got, we do it with our American athletes too. You know, you got Simone Biles last year was, our last time was one of the most hated ones because she dropped out and she let her country down. And now she's a big hero again. And, it's like just so wishy-washy um, and I know like the wrestling I was telling Wendy the wrestling men's team underperformed which kind of overshadowed the great stuff that the women's team did and um, you kind of get caught up into it but the whole purpose of it was unity and that kind of got me thinking about the Last Supper okay after Jesus did the Last Supper and he knew what was coming he went to the garden to pray with his disciples and they fell asleep on him because let's face it they're other humans, but he's praying, and he's praying like hard because he knows it's coming. And one of the things he prays for is unity amongst the church. And you can see how that turned out. You know, his one act that is supposed to bring unity to Jews, Gentiles, to the world alike, is supposed to be bring freedom. Satan, you know, twists it, and he turns it, and he makes it to where we have different denominations, different religions, different arguments, you know, how should we take the communion? Should it be one cup or should it be a bunch of cups? So, you know, it's like, what does it signify? Um, and it just causes division. And that's one of those things that we got to remember that in scripture, God is all about love and peacefulness, not necessarily like inclusion and tolerance, like the world wants us to believe, but love and and peace, be a peacemaker, not cause division, not cause strife, okay? And that's that was the whole purpose of his act on the cross. Okay, we were divided from God by our sin. He wanted to bridge that gap. He wanted to bring something that would unify Jews, God's chosen people, and Gentiles together to where we could have a common interest. And if you've ever seen two people who are totally different from each other that are both believers in Christ, they could spend hours talking, even though they only have one thing in common, and that's the love of Christ, okay? With that in our hearts, that unity, that peace, okay, that comes from him. Anything else, any division, any hate, that comes from Satan, okay? So when we do this act of communion today, remember what Christ died for. He died for our freedom from sin, but he also died so that we could be ambassadors for him, kind of like the athletes are for our countries in the Olympics. 
we are ambassadors for him in our everyday world. We're representing what he stood for. He stood for love and truth and peace. And we're supposed to bring that out there. If we're bringing anything other than that, then we are taking away from his purpose. Um, so at this time, please come forward. we got three spots. Grab a bread, grab some juice, return back to your seat, take a moment of prayer, connect with your Savior, with your Father in heaven. And then we will take the elements as a church body together. On the night when he'd be betrayed, when he was sitting with his disciples, enjoying their Passover meal, he got up and he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. same way he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins let's pray Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the beautiful weather that you've given us the last couple of days. And uh, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for this act of communion that, that, that Christ set down for his disciples. And they recorded it in, in the book so that we could continue to honor you with this tradition and this symbol. Lord, we pray that you continue to help us remember what it represents. Remember what you freed us from. And now that we are, as our athletes are in the Olympics, we are ambassadors for you. We pray that you give us the courage and the strength to listen to the Holy Spirit, to live for you in this world and to glorify you with our actions and our lives. We pray that your Holy Spirit walks with each and every one of us and continues to guide us in your ways of righteousness. Lord, we thank you for this worship team. We thank you for this church. 
just ask that you continue to be in this place. Help us to continue to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the next thing for me is reading the scriptures. Uh, so we did one through seven last week, so now we're starting, or one through six last week, so now we're starting on verse seven of Romans chapter seven. Okay, so let's go ahead and get right into it. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me covering of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. All right, let's pray one more time. Uh, Lord, we ask that you uh, lift up Pastor Steve as he comes to preach on these messages today. Uh, let these words just enter into our hearts and our minds. Uh, let your Holy Spirit convict us in any way that we need to be convicted so that we, we can correct our actions and correct our lives, that we can be repentant of any sin that we have. Lord, that we can experience that true freedom and that true life, the life that comes with believing in you and having you in our hearts so that way we are no longer dead to sin but we are alive in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my portion in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, lost in peace. Trusting God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Oh, I trust in God, my Savior.
Good morning and welcome to a place where uh, we value the relationship with God over any rule that could be or has been. We're here simply this morning to deepen and further our relationship with God and a byproduct of doing that we go to the scripture and in going to the scripture we see a lot of things happening. So last week we started this, uh, this study, right? Romans 7 that will be in for the month of August. Today is the first, uh, or the second rather, of four uh, weeks in this study. Last week we talked from the message titled, Unforgivably Ignorant, and we covered verses 1 through 6. In doing so, we took away a thought, those who understand they need Jesus stand under God's word and never over God's will for others. Now today we're going to extend that conversation as the Bible extends and elaborates further on this issue. So today we're going to talk from a message I titled Unimaginable Intelligence. Now you military guys, those guys that have ever even studied the military, you know how important intelligence is whenever you're going out for an assignment, right? You want to know what is happening in the world I'm walking into. Right? You want to know the routes, the best routes to go there to avoid attacks, to avoid danger, to get the mission accomplished. And in doing that, what happens is you develop tactics that are successful, correct? And so intelligence in every aspect of it, now let's go into the war that we are in here today. We're in a war too. And we're in a uh, multiple setting type scenario of a war. First and foremost, every person in here that is saved, welcome to the war with yourself that will exist the rest of your life. The Bible says in Galatians 5 that our, our fight is with our flesh, right? The flesh wants to do what it wants to do, but then God gives us the spirit. And so now there's this war going on interpersonally. Beyond that, the greater war that exists is the war between good and evil, that which exists between God and Satan that was conquered through Jesus Christ. Now, we war not against flesh and blood, but against the evil uh, authorities and the evil things in the heavenly realms that we cannot even see. The Bible tells us that. So understanding these things, I want to take away a thought. Good intelligence identifies where attacks will come from and gives us wisdom on ways we can withstand on our way to win the war. So we win in the end, right? But while we're here, we're, we're, we're not feeling victorious all the time. Things are tough. Life happens. Welcome to the world that Jesus promised, trials and tribulations, right? Now, in it, we have moments of reprieve. We have moments of release. And there are moments to gather and collect ourselves. And I hope today is one of those times where you can do what I intentionally do before I come out here to preach, which is saying, you know, God, I'm, I'm here to receive from you, and the rest is the rest, okay? As I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching a, lot, a, a, a word that is living and active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and guess what? It cuts me sometimes, too, while I preach it. It speaks to me while I preach it, and the Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So as we hear the word of God, there's something God wants to say to us this morning as a congregation, as people individually, and uh, I feel that we're going to get to that today. So before we jump into the text, which I have three thoughts from, verses 7 through 12 today in God's word, I want to tell you what my Bible titles this portion of scripture, sin's use of the law. Sin's use of of the law. Now, if you think about that for a second, okay, Paul is preaching to people who are guided by the law, right? They live in the law. As a matter of fact, this is one of the most uh, evil, if not the, the number one of evils in governments that has ever existed. This is the Roman government that crucified Jesus Christ, right? And while they didn't particularly invent crucifixion, they certainly perfected the uh, most horrific forms of doing so, to include Jesus's and many others. So as we get into this, uh, what Paul is trying to say is sin can use the law against you. Okay. Sin looks for opportunities. And guys, I'm going to tell you something right off the bat. 
there is no greater rebellion that exists than that which exists in places where rules are more important than relationships. My kids and I have great relationships, right? In having a great relationship with your kids, do you think they're always going to follow the rules? When they uh, break the first rule, do you stop loving them? That'd be a bummer. But what I want to assume is somewhere throughout life, there are people within the sound of my voice that stopped receiving love. For whatever reason, for whatever purpose, life event, hurt, hardship, betrayal, the list goes on, you stopped feeling and knowing your love. Or maybe you never really accepted it to begin with. First thing I want to talk about is what sin is and where it started. Now, this is going to be a little bit different because we go a lot of different directions theologically. I can tell you what sin is, right? I can tell you about hamartia and missing the mark and it's the air and, you know, mess up and it's an archery term and you don't hit the bullseye, right? Now, we could go all there, but Paul's going to say this different and he's going to say it basically like this, okay? It's defined in the law. The law defines. That's what that That's what sin is. You know, the do's and do nots like we talked about last week. You know, don't commit adultery was last week, right? Now this week, he's going to get into another example or illustration, which is going to be coveting. But it's defined in the law, but it's also developed through the law. Okay? If rules don't exist, we don't know we're breaking them. Right? Why do you use your blinker? Why do you drive a certain speed, maybe differently when you see the police? Or get the little notification on your phone, there's a speed trap ahead. Which, by the way, there's guys like me that exist that just like to label that everywhere I go. Right? Verse 7 here, Paul says, what should we say then is the law sin? Absolutely not. On the contrary, I wouldn't. Now, this is Paul. Remember what Paul, Remember who Paul is and what Paul did. He was, what does he say? He was like the Pharisee of Pharisees, an expert of the law, smartest, most equipped in the law. It was Paul who was once Saul before he converted into Christianity in that radical moment in the road in Damascus. And that before that, you remember what uh, Paul or Saul was doing, right? He was killing Christians, perceiving they were what? Breaking the law. Bending the rules. And so that's where we met. Now Paul was Saul at in the book of Acts. Well, he says, me, myself, I wouldn't even have known what sin is if it weren't for the law. For example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. So I read the rule, right? It was, it was on the, the stones, right? Moses, like, inscribed these things and the Ten Commandments, you know, and last week, do not commit adultery, and now he points to this next one, which is do not covet. He said, it was knowing that, right, that gave me the knowledge that this is sin. When we're told not to do something, there's a reaction. Is that fair? How many of you guys have ever been around frantic or fearful people? Oh, no, 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 no. Right? I was a combat engineer. We dealt with explosives, so I can kind of understand that to a sense. But when we're talking about like going outside and it's too hot, okay, let's let's not get dramatic. All right, we can, we, we we can adjust, we can improvise, we can overcome, we can do a lot of different things with that. What Paul's saying here is he's saying, okay, 
as I allowed the law to define this thing, it developed my knowledge to know it was wrong. Why? Because it says, don't do this. We tell our kids not to do certain things. What do you think happens in their mind when you say that? They know they shouldn't do that. It doesn't mean they won't want to do that, which is a whole other issue he's getting ready to get into. Well, covet. By definition, it's to have a desire or lust for something that is forbidden. I shouldn't want this, right? I should want to hear pastor's sermon, but man, it's Sunday and my belly's getting full and you know, I, I should want to sing that song, but, you know, I should, you know, but, eh. Remember, war number one is with ourselves. It's our flesh, the sarks, that which, is, that which opposes what God wants. And so he gives us the spirit so that we don't do naturally what we want to do. Because we don't want to do the best of things at times. He says, for example, I would have not known what it, what it is to covet had the law not said don't covet, okay? So this is the second illustration, the second example. Last week was adultery. Now he moves on to number two, verses eight through ten. What sin does and when it will do it? What sin does and when it will do it? And sin... Seizing an opportunity. All right, now this word opportunity is a very interesting word. Okay, a lot of us, we, we think about opportunity, right? When opportunity, nice, so there's an opportunity or that's an opportunity. In this sense, in the original Greek language, it's this word aphorme, which is a place from which a movement or attack is made. It's a base of operation. How many of you guys have watched kids uh, play tag or they're playing war or whatever they're doing? And then like, I'm at base. You can't mess with me. Right? This is base. And from base, what do they do? They devise their strategy to go make an attack. Guys, the Bible tells us this. But it's something we always need to remember. 1 Peter 5, 7 and 8. 1 Peter 5, 7 says we should cast all of our cares and anxieties upon God because he cares for us, right? And, and when we do that, it prevents the likelihood of the second occurring, which is 1 Peter 5, 8. The enemy roars around like a lion seeking to devour whomever he may. Okay? So when I'm not going to God with what I have going on and when I'm not unpacking and when I'm not sorting these things out, Satan is like all over me now. And we know what it says all the way back in Genesis, whenever like, uh, you know, the Cain and Abel thing, and there was this big strong urge and this big strong anger that was happening, and he's like, I'm going to go kill my brother, and then God's like trying to like prevent it, right? And we know what God says there to him. He says, be careful, Sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is to rule you. Well, he heard that, and it still didn't work. He killed his brother. Right? We can hear the word. We can have the Holy Spirit. We can know that we shouldn't. But our flesh feels way differently. Our flesh, from it, we have all. We have all. All of us at this point in life, we have developed proclivities, propensities, maladaptive coping me mechanisms, unhealthy skills that we've developed just to survive, just to get through. And our flesh is loaded with that as our fallback. Well, he says there's, a, there's an opportunity. 
sin seized an opportunity. How, Paul? Tell us. Through the commandment. The devil used God's rule to incite rebellion within Paul. What? Can the devil do that? Can he? How many people do you think have destroyed other people using this book? Has it happened? How many people have ever been to church, do you think, in America where they felt like they couldn't be forgiven? In a church, which is to point to forgiveness. The devil's always had the same goal. He deceives, he destroys, and then you know what happens? Others get destroyed. One destroyed person destroys many people in their path. And when it comes back to it, that is a deceived person. That is a person that has at some point in time bought into some sort of lie that is not rooted in actual pleasant truth. Verses 8 through 10, two things. What sin does and when it does it, it orchestrates attacks. And it does it when the law leads over love. Do you remember Jesus when he said like the greatest, you know, what teacher, what are the greatest commandments, right? Remember all that? And, and, and he said something. And it was weird because he didn't say all these things that you shouldn't do. Is the greatest commandment. He said the greatest commandment is this. That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that from there you would love others. The way that God has loved you. Right? This is the greatest commandment. Trumps every other commandment. Trumps every other rule. Jesus says there's one thing I want from all of you. It's to love from a place that you've been loved. Right? The scripture says we love because God, what? First loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son Jesus so that whomsoever believed would never perish but have eternal life. We're here because of love. And from that place of love, there's a lot that we can do. Parents, we know this. There's a lot of heavy conversations we have to have with our kids at certain points. They may not feel as loving as what they did in the beginning when all I could do was hold this beautiful baby and they couldn't articulate anything that was coming from my mouth. So the only thing I could do in this moment is just love this little being. In this kind of nurturing way. And then as they grow, you build upon that foundation. And then someday, you know, all of a sudden you have to start having some harder talks. Well, God works that way too. He says, in sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me, coveting of every kind. What? So... I knew this was a sin, but yet now it's intensified. Before I didn't know it was wrong, it wasn't that bad. But now I know I shouldn't, and dang, I really want to. Paul, are you okay? Well, what I, what I believe is the second the flesh sees something is forbidden, should we dwell on it, it becomes more fun to us. Anybody agree with that? Are there a lot of things that seem fun that are forbidden? Here's how this works, guys. I'm going to give you an example, okay? 
what I want you guys to do is not think about how good Reese's Peanut Butter Cups is for a second. Don't think about the deliciousness of a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, okay? Don't go there. Don't think about the big cup. Don't think about the dark chocolate cup. Don't let the white cup. There's no, 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 no. Don't even imagine it. How many of you guys just raise your hand? Anybody else like you want a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup now? I didn't, now I do. How many of you guys have had many stupid nights where they weren't really planned by you, but somebody included you, and you just decided, that sounds like fun? Anybody? That'd be me. Well, sin does something, and it does something at a particular point. It orchestrates attacks. Issues arise, and temptation is magnified with rules because rules naturally incite the flesh's rebellion. And it does this when law leads over love. Third and final thing, we'll read the rest of verses 8 and 8 through 10, sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Without the law, I don't know what I don't know. And without the law, that like doesn't have any power, right? But now I know the law and it holds this kind of authority over me. And because of this authority, I know what I should or shouldn't do. But yet here I keep finding myself and I can't hit that mark. He says, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Okay, so he's like, I, I was living and I thought that life was good and then it got real bad. Here's what Paul just said. I only had to deal with war number one until I opened the word of God. The second I started reading what God did and did not want, I got another enemy. And we know what the thief does. John 10, 10, right? Thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? So as he starts wanting this life with God, life gets harder. Is that true? Is it hard to live a God-honoring life, guys? Is it hard to do what God wants you to do sometimes? We don't naturally do it in the flesh. That's the point. Third, final thing, what sin creates when creation allows it. Verses 11 and 12. He said, for sin, seizing an opportunity, there's that word again, through the commandment, what did it do? It deceived me. It deceived me. Guys, you got to understand. We never learn about Saul until we see him killing Christians. That's where he appears in the book of Acts. Am I right or wrong? Am I lying to you? Did I just make this up? At some point in Saul's life, he was looking for guidance and he thought he found it. He was living for the law. He was living by the law. And he was living through the law. And you know what happened? Sin used the law against him. Dang, that's a bummer. Didn't Jesus say something like that? Judge others lest ye be judged. And when you do it, you're held to a higher measure. Well, guys, I want to talk about this word deceived. In the original language, 
kind of sounds like potato a little bit. Exapatao. Exapatao. To believe something that is not true. Typically in order to gain some personal advantage. That's part two, but it's most first and formal step is when we ourselves are deceived. You ever heard those self-deceived? Have you ever heard that? That was, that was self-deceiving. And you know what that is for what it is? It's this simple. It's failing to admit to your own self that something is true. Could it be true that you're not perfect? Could it be true that you and I have sinned? Could it be true that we need Jesus? Could it be true? Could all of these truths be true even though I don't really feel like sometimes they're the truth? Or want to believe, by the way, they're the truth. Okay, so now let's go back to Saul becomes Paul. For sin seizes an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, it killed me. Dude, who, who, was the, who was the artist of, uh, Bobby, you're probably, you're, you're going to be my best, maybe Kirby, one of you guys back there, Blinded by the Light. Who sang that song? What is it? Manford Man? Manford Man, right? Blinded by the Light. That's Saul's theme song. Right? That's Paul. He was blinded by the light. I don't know about the rest of the song. We'll just use that part. All right? What happened when Paul hit the light? The same thing that happened when Moses hit the light. The same thing that happened when Isaiah hits the light. The same thing that happened when John in Patmos, living on fire for the Lord, saw just the smallest glimpse of of the light. They all thought they were dead. Isaiah himself recorded, I'm a man of unclean lips. I must be getting ruined. Moses feared death at the burning bush. Yes. That was the angel of the Lord, by the way. John fell on his face. When he caught the glimpse, Paul's recording of the event, he thought he was dead, he's blind, and then has to follow instructions to go get healed. Up until that point, what was he doing? He was on his way to keep doing what he thought was okay to do. He was deceived. How many of you guys have ever been on your way to do something dumb and God bust you? Anybody? I tell my wife all the time, man. I don't know how, so, like, sometimes I feel harassed by the Holy Spirit. Like, literally, like, Satan makes me feel. Satan deceives me. Does this happen with any of you other guys? Like, he, God's just killing my fun. Can't do this. Not, not, what about everybody else? And I start like pointing it, projecting it outwards, right? Why don't other people feel bad for this? Why don't other people have to feel this? Why don't other people hear this? Instead of understanding what's really happening in that moment, God disciplines and chastens the one he loves. It's not an everybody else thing. It's me and him. But Satan wants us to get all caught up everywhere else so he can deceive us more and deflect more. Well, what sin creates when creation allows it, he says, and he lands on this idea in verse 12, he said, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. He's like, okay, so I'm, I'm down with it all, but you got to understand, sin is created in places creation allows it to it's not that the law is bad he says it's that when people get deceived by it 
it destroys them and many others around them. Here's the order I put it in. Deceit. Created through the commandment. Formed in rebellion from a rule. Deceit people. A deceived person becomes a deceitful person. Because they think something is true that is not true. And you know why they bought into it usually? Here's why, ready? Keep reading the media. Stupid idea. Keep going to Fox. Keep going here. Keep going. All that's dumb because it has an agenda behind it. I'm not saying there's not facts, and I'm not saying some of us haven't been. I'll tell you, me personally, I, I, I don't care about it. I could, Andrew and I had a conversation the other day on the phone, and him and I are having an understanding, but I always re-clarify, though, not Andrew, because you know my problem. You know who I am. But I said to him, I started off and I said, understand, brother, we can talk about anything in the world, but it comes from the baseline of the common thread we have the Holy Spirit to be able to discern as we discuss anything under the sun, even the most evil of things, like Paul said in Psalms, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, because God's rod and staff comforts me. There are some people that just get swayed easy. They don't have that discernment. They don't have the Holy Spirit. So deceit and then deceived people, the devil operated, he deceived them, now they're destroyed. You know what they do? They destroy others. Wasn't that Paul's story? Guys, he, he was literally, how many people do you think he was behind their murders and their executions? We're introduced to him and he's holding coats for people as Stephen, which by the way I want to clarify again, he only got stoned because he misspelled his name. Guys, Stephen, PH, don't trust him. V, victory. Okay? But he's, he's grabbing people's coats so they have more leverage to throw the stone harder. And deceive people, bring their death to other people. He said, through that, sin killed me. Yes, it did, and it killed many others through him. I'm going to close with a thought with the worship team coming up. Tell me if you agree with this statement. Destroyed people destroy people. You've heard it said, probably hurting people hurt people. There's, you know, that thing that floats around and, you know, if we're not careful, we bleed on others who didn't cut us to begin with, right? And we don't want to bleed on those people. But here's the second part and the greater part, and here's my exhortation for us as a congregation today. Because remember at the beginning I said for some people the issue isn't anything else, but it's because you've never or at some point lost sight of the fact that you're loved. And how many people know that people respond differently to love? Is that true? When you walk into a room and you perceive the people there love you and they like you and they're happy to see you and it feels like there's just something it does for the soul. Amen? And then there's places where love just isn't there. All right, now we're going to go into like more of my stuff, okay, country. Lady Antebellum, baby. Love don't live here anymore. Do you, know, do you know that in every place, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and that's a universal purpose? In my fear is for so many Christians, they carry different things in life around with them because life is still happening to them. Let me go a little bit further and say I believe this happens to each and every one of us. And I believe that if we're not careful, 
we carry it into places that were created to be safe spaces and those no longer are places of safety for us or others around us because they feel the weight of what we're carrying around, if you know what I'm saying. In all of us, we come into this room and we come together and guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been a pastor for almost two decades in some way, shape, or form, okay? And I've seen a lot and I've dealt with a lot, but you know what? I've seen and dealt with myself and I know how scary that is. And I'd be a fool to tell you that I'm up here ever and I'm thinking you guys are just going out and 100% of the time all your thoughts are fixed on God and you can't wait to serve him. No, I think that sometimes bad things happen to you. I think that sometimes you, I know, sorry, might even do bad things. But you know what I love? We can bring every bad thing into an environment where good overcomes bad. We can bring every law that we've ever broken into an environment where love leads over the law. And the Bible literally tells us there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And we love each other the most and we fulfill Jesus' greatest commandment on our lives when we carry each other's burdens. Do you know why? Because we know we're not carrying it. We're just carrying it where they should have carried it to the cross of Jesus Christ. And you and I, we exist in this sin-filled world with one purpose. Our job is to take each other by the hand and put one another in God's hand. And there's not a single one of you that have ever walked through the door and even people that will walk out of this door and never come back that won't always be in my prayers. I pray Jesus over them. And I pray Jesus over you. Because where his name is, the power of sin is defeated. The power of Satan goes away. All the darkness, all the despondency, all the depression, all the disillusionment, all the deceit, it's all crystal clear when Jesus shows up and shines his bright light of love into the darkest of places. And I don't know about you, but I am grateful that Jesus came into the darkness of my life and shined a light. And the light said one thing, I love you and I'm not going anywhere that's my Jesus that's this Jesus and you know what we get to do even though we're sinners even though we fail even when we fall down God doesn't give up on us he doesn't revoke his love you know what he does he re-invokes his call and confirms it over your life just like David prayed when he had fell fallen and failed so miserably in Psalm 51 he said God just forgive me Don't take your spirit away from me. I just want to go out and keep doing what I was doing. I want to keep doing your purpose. And what did Jesus say? Wait five years. Go to this many classes. Hit the confessional booth this many times. No, this is in a day where the spirit would come and go when a man would leave. When a man would leave God's will for his life, the spirit's going with him. We live in the day neither height, depth, angels, demons, nothing in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God. And the Holy Spirit isn't visiting you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And even in that day, and even in that time, David wasn't put on probation. No. David was put back on the mission field. 
and I don't care who you are and I don't care what you've done. The enemy is a liar and God loves you so much that he died in your place through his son on the cross and he's got a plan not for you to stay down, not for you to stay defeated, but to get up and to go out and do what he has called you to do and until you get out, you won't get out of your mind right where the enemy wants you so church I say today let's stick it back to Satan let's give him what he came for you want to fight with me guys we fight better together don't we you want to fight with me All right. I'm not coming at you like David said with a sling and a rock I'm coming at you with a name I'm not fighting you underneath my strength or our strength as a group. I'm fighting Satan and I am destroying Satan and his dark work in the name above all names and the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords and the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Church, can you help me proclaim the name of Jesus greater than anything else today and give him a thanks for a love that will never leave or forsake you. God bless you. I love you. Peace. There's a lot of things that happen in this world, and the one comfort that we get to take is something that I love about this song. We're, we're all in his hands. Things are going right, things are going wrong all the time for everybody, but the context of what's happening is all different whenever you realize that you sit in the Father's house and you get to be a part of his household, part of his family, and under his care. It's just beautiful. So everybody sing this with us. If the story isn't good now, then failures never find no way in the father's in the room. I said, if failures never find no way in the father's in the room.
come home to help us find hope. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors swing wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place. Next week. See you next week. Love you guys. Word super.